My dad told me that I had an uncle who was actually a retired war marine. I've seen people that are a hundred times fitter than me physically fail because they don't like the other side of it. You know, faster up and out of helicopters, skiing in the Arctic, up to their chest in water going through the jungle. It's very, very sandy, very, very dusty. So when this IED detonated, this huge dust cloud was created. And I looked down to where my legs should have been and they had both been completely ripped off uh, from the knees down. And it got to the point where you kind of feel like you've, you've snapped. And then the only really thing you think is, I don't want to do this. Just for those who don't know, just introduce yourself and who you are. My name is Mark Ormald. I'm a former Royal Marines Commando. And I was injured in Afghanistan back on Christmas Eve 2007 and became the UK's first triple amputee from the conflict. Um, whereabouts did you grow up, area, and also just a description of what that was like? So I grew up here in the beautiful city of Plymouth, uh, born and bred here, stayed here, um, have no plans to leave here because um, I love this place. Um, and growing up was, you know, I had a very privileged childhood, you know, I never wanted for anything, never needed anything, everything was provided for me. Um, never really faced any hardships growing up, so I was very, very lucky in that respect. For an American audience, description of what Plymouth is like. So Plymouth is an ocean city. We're on the coast, which is great. We're right by the water, so um, and, and I love the water, so it's a huge benefit for me. But it's a very small city. You know, it's a very military city. We have. The Royal Marines are here, the Royal Navy are here, we have the Army here. The only thing we don't have is the Royal Air Force. We have a big university, so it's very diverse. You know, we have the people that live here, the locals, the university population, and the military population, which is another reason why I love it so much. So, yeah, to, is, is that what's led to a pathway to the military, the fact that you're in, in this place where it's surrounded by military? Like, and if it is, how did you make the transition from like school into the military? So that's a, it's a funny story. You know, when I was about 15 and a half, all the people that I grew up with, all my friends, were two or three years older than me. So when I was about 15 and a half, coming towards the end of my compulsory education, most of my friends had left school, left education, and gone on to start their careers. And a huge chunk of them had joined the military. And they were in the army. Uh, we had, I had friends in Germany, friends in the UK, friends that were dotted all over the world. And they would always come home on their leave periods. And it seemed like they always had, you know, cool stories to tell me. They had money in the bank. They were always out partying and having a good time. And I reached that point in my life where I had to make a decision. You know, I'm nearly 16. My exams are on the horizon. What do I want to do? Do I want to go on to further education or do I want to go and start a career? And because of the influence that they had on me, you know, it kind of steered me towards the career path, you know, and because they were most of them were military, I thought that's what I want to do. Now, the strange thing is that I didn't know who the Royal Marines were, you know, despite them having a big footprint in Plymouth and in this city, I just thought that if you wanted to be a soldier, you know, and run around doing cool stuff with bayonets in your teeth and crawling through the mud, that you join the army. So one of my friends who was already serving took me down to the career center one day and I spoke to the recruiter. He gave me all the paperwork that I needed. Because of my age, I had to take it back and get my parents to sign it. And then when I did, my dad told me that I had an uncle who was actually a retired war marine. And he only lived about 15 miles up the road. So we hopped in the car, we drove up there one weekend and he talked me through his entire career. He started as a Marine, which is our equivalent of a private. And 22 years later, he retired as a captain. And he told me why the Royal Marines were different, the kind of things that he'd done in his career, what I could expect to experience if that's the route that I wanted to go down. So I then went back home, back to the career center. I spoke to the Royal Marines recruiter. And he pulled out, this is how long ago it was, he pulled out the VHS cassette. He put it in one of those TV video combi things that were all the rage back in the day. And I watched this video 
and my jaw like hit the floor. I saw guys, you know, faster up and out of helicopters, skiing in the Arctic, up to their chest in water going through the jungle. You know, and it just seemed like these guys could go anywhere, do anything at any time. And I got goosebumps. I'm getting goosebumps now just thinking about it. And that was it. You know, my mind was made up. I was like, that's what I want to do. So I went back to school, did my exams, did pretty well. You know, I got nine A to C's, one D, so I could have easily gone on to the college university later on. But my mind was was made up. I wanted to be a, a Royal Marines commando, and that was all I was focused on. And when I left school, that's exactly what I did. Pre pre military, what was your mindset like as, as, a, as a young person, as a, <clears throat> as a young man? What was your was was it hot, as as hard as it is now? Did the military shape it, or did you always have that about yourself? The military definitely strengthened and, and molded my mindset. But, you know, I was born in the 80s, grew up in the 90s. I'm a, I'm a big action movie fan. So I grew up with your Stallones, your Schwarzeneggers, your John claude Van Dams, and I used to watch these movies all the time. And it's what I wanted to be like. I wanted to be the big, tough guy, but the, the kind, gentle guy at the same time. Do you know what I mean? Like the, the gentleman hero type thing. And it kind of all tied in with pushing me towards the military. Now, I, I trained martial arts a lot when I was younger, before I joined. I did Muay Thai, full contact kickboxing, and boxing. And I think that helped initiate that kind of mindset of train hard, you know, you get in the ring, you compete, don't give up, keep fighting, you know, just keep pushing, 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 self-development, improving yourself, trying to push your limits and see what it is you're capable of doing. So it kind of started at 12, 13, through martial arts. And then when I went into the, the Royal Marines, you know, it just accelerated massively. The VHS that you'd watched, you know when you got that first experience, was it what you'd expected? The first physical experience? Yeah, yeah. It, so it was intense. You know, when you, when you apply for the Royal Marines, back in the day, you used to have to do what was called the Potential Royal Marines course, which is three days at the Commando Training Center of just non-stop physical activity. You know, up at five o'clock in the morning, straight into the gym, straight down to the assault course, five minutes to eat. You know, it's, it's like a three day, what we call a, a beasting. And it's an opportunity for you as an individual to have that small experience and decide, is this really for me or is this not for me? And it's a chance for the people that are training and assessing you to look at you and go, okay, he's ready, we can start training, or you need to go back and maybe do a bit more physical training and rethink about what it is you want. Unfortunately, I passed it. You know, I went there, passed it first time when I was, I think I was 16 at the time, or 17, and then came home. I had a training program that was written specifically for me by the Royal Marines, and that's all I did. I wasn't interested in anything else, you no know, going out partying, messing around, it was just training, following that program to the letter, waiting for a letter to drop on my doorstep saying, come and start your training. So the, the, real, the Royal Marines training, what is that like? like what is that process like? It's brutal. Um, it's, it's world renowned for being arguably the, the longest and hardest regular forces training in the world. Special forces training is obviously that next level, but in terms of regular, Forces infantry, it's, it's the longest and hardest in the world. And you have to be extremely fit physically. Yeah, and that's, it's very progressive and gradual and you build up over 32 plus weeks to be able to do the, the final phase, which is called the commando phase. But if you're not mentally robust, if you can't be cold, wet, sleep deprived, food deprived, you know, covered in blisters with four or five miles left to march, if you can't do that and conquer your mind, then you won't make it. And then I've seen people that are a hundred times fitter than me physically fail because they don't like the other side of it. The, the mindset, like, yeah, mm -hmm. describe, describe that of what you feel it takes to get past that training. You have to evolve, like, very rapidly. You know, I was 17 years old when I did it, I was still a boy and I was surrounded by men. I was the second youngest in my troop 
everyone else had more life experience and, and more experience in everything than I did. And it was very overwhelming. It was very scary. It was very intimidating. And you have to adapt really quickly and just run with it. And I think you develop your own way of dealing with it. And what I did personally was, you know, 30 weeks is a long time. It's 32 now, it was 30 when I did it. You have to break that down into chunks, you know, almost month by month, week by week, and then sometimes day by day. And that was the mindset that I adopted. I just thought, right, get through this day, get through this week, get through this month, tick the box. And then we restart again and, you know, keep pushing, keep pushing, keep pushing. And eventually, you know, as long and, and as arduous as it was, eventually you'll get there and then you can start your career and do the fun stuff. So yeah, starting the career, what was, what was that like, the first experience again? So I started training in February 2001 when I was 17 and I finished in October 2001. 9-11 was September 2001. So four weeks before I had finished my training, we all witnessed that. And so we knew that everything we'd been trained to do, we were gonna to have to put into practice in the real world very, very quickly. Which, you know, I'd just turned 18 at that point. You know, for an 18 year old who was about to earn his Green Beret and become a Royal Marines Commando, who's very cocky and, and arrogant and brash at that age, you think you're invincible. It was quite exciting. You know, the, the thought and the prospect of going out to war and testing yourself, seeing if you've actually got what it takes in a real environment to perform and do your job. So it was quite exciting, you know, and we very quickly did after um, finishing training, go out there and, and see if we could do what we had to do. Uh, for yourself, mentally, as, as a young man, being mm -hmm. out there, did it, was it met your expectations? Was it scarier than you thought or? So initially, 2002, I got trained to go to Afghanistan on something called Operation Jakana. But after all that training, for some reason, it got scaled back and a load of us didn't go. So I was a little bit disappointed about that. But then 2003, uh, Iraq came around and I was deployed on Operation Telic 1. So we spent about a month in Kuwait. We, you know, we sat on that border. Then when we were given the green light, we pushed over that Kuwaiti Iraqi border and we went and um, did what we had to do in Iraq. And I spent three and a half months in there. And I didn't fire a single round. You know, I, I came back, I was, I was assigned with a couple of my friends as force protection for a, a medical regiment. So I thought we'd see a lot of action. I didn't see a thing. And I came back and, I, and I, as weird as it sounds, I was disappointed. I thought I've done all this training and you know, I'm supposed to be this elite level soldier. And I'm supposed to be able to go and do the business. I've just gone to war. I was 19 by this point. And I didn't do anything. And I came back and I thought, okay, is that it? And what was good about it was that was all within the first three or four years of my career. So I thought, okay, I'm 19 years old. I've earned a Green Beret. I've been to war. I've kind of ticked a few boxes already. Um, anything else now is just a bonus. But yeah, it, was, it strangely was a bit disappointing coming back from Iraq. But a couple of years later, when Afghanistan became a hot topic again, I would get the opportunity to go out to a different kind of environment and then actually test my skills and see if I was good enough. Yeah, so what was the difference the, the next time around? They were worlds apart. In Afghanistan, as soon as you hit the ground, you hit the ground running. And um, you could be fighting at all different hours of the day, two, three o'clock in the morning, it doesn't matter. You know, night, day, all throughout the year it's, it's a very it was a very kinetic environment and you were constantly at an elevated state of alertness you know constantly you could never really relax you always had to be ready at the drop of a hat to go and do something you know and, and over the course of a six month pour um, I think that takes its toll on people in the midst of that you know like in, in the midst of the action at that point what did it mean to you to be a Royal Marine at that at that point that was exactly what I thought it was going to be. You know what I mean? And I was very, as, as, and this is not, you know, false bravado or me trying to be macho. I was very comfortable in that environment. And I think that was mostly down to knowing about the men I had around me who had all been through the same training, who were all at the same level, who were all extremely professional and we all had each other's back. So despite how dangerous the environment was, I knew 
all around me were men that were willing to do whatever it takes to keep me safe as I would be willing to do whatever it takes to keep them safe. So, you know, very comfortable in that kind of environment and, you know, doing what it was that I trained to do. Was it that, was it a tour in uh, Afghanistan where the incident happened? Was that the, it was, the, yeah. the tour? Yeah. So for, for me, can you like, the morning off, like do you remember the morning <coughs> off? With, like I know some people have like vivid recollections before stuff like this happens mm -hmm. of, the, of the day. Is, is that something you can remember yourself? Absolutely. Yeah, we, we were called up to the headquarters compound. It was Christmas Eve, 2007. We were called up to the headquarters compound and we were given a brief on a foot patrol that we we're gonna go on. Something we'd done a million times before in the three months that we'd been there. We went back to our compound as normal, started preparing all of our kit and equipment as normal. And then we went back up to the headquarters compound. We formed up by the rear entrance of our camp in two sections and we got ready to leave. Now the idea of this patrol was that we would have two sections with eight men in each section. We'd leave the rear entrance of camp. One section would go north, one would go south. We got told to patrol the immediate perimeter of the camp, pushing no more than 300 meters out. And then the two sections would meet at the front entrance of the camp, so now the opposite side, secure the location, close things down, and finish up for the day. Now in terms of what we had done to that point, this was the most basic kind of patrol that you could ever go on. Prior to that, we had been going you know, two, three, four, five, six miles out, eight, nine, ten hours, whatever it was. We had a mission, we had an objective. We'd go out, we'd, we'd execute that, and we'd come back. This was literally go out the back door, walk around camp, come in the front door. Now, we had no intelligence that gave us any cause for concern. We, we had a very firm grasp on our area of operations. We knew what was going on. So it was a walk in the park, or, or so we thought. The time came, uh, they opened up the rear entrance. I was second in command of the section that went north, the other guys went south, and we went out and did what we were tasked to do. About five hours into it, both sections then found themselves at the opposite side of camp, so now at the front entrance, ready to, to close things down, to finish it up and uh, go back into camp. Now my section, we're on a high piece of ground, what we call the North Fort. Just underneath us, when we looked down, we could see the base that we're working out of. And then beneath that, just off to the side of the main dirt road that ran through the area, was the other section that we left with earlier in the day. Now, because we're in an elevated position, tactically, we're in a very advantageous position because we can see everything around us and it's a lot easier to fight going down a hill than it is up. So our job, to finish up was to give those guys protection so they could go back in the camp, get behind the perimeter wall, they were safe, they would then protect us, we'd go back in, finish up, done for the day. Very, very easy, basic, low level stuff. So we're up on the high feature and the section commander took his half of the section and started giving them fire positions. I took my half of the section and about four meters in front of me, there was a shallow bowl in the ground. Now normally what you would do, if you go farm on a patrol, if you stop, you would take cover behind a building, a wall, a tree, a rock, whatever you can find to give yourself protection and, and cover. But we're on a high feature. And I saw this bow and thought, okay, if we get in there, we get down on our stomachs, you're not gonna be able to see us. It's gonna be very difficult to attack us. This is the best form of protection that we can have given the environment that we're in. So I jumped in. The other half of the section started taking up their fire positions. When they were happy, they gave me the thumbs up. I had a, a couple of last minute checks I had to run through. And then when I was happy, I slowly started walking over towards the position that I selected for myself. And as I went to get down to my stomach, I put my right knee on the floor. And that was the moment that I knelt on and detonated an improvised explosive device. So, I mean, uh, that, like, what is, is a recollection of, of it happening? I remember it, yeah, I remember all of it. Yeah, it was, um, you have to imagine the terrain that we're working in, right? It's very, very sandy, very, very dusty. So when this 
IED detonated, this huge dust cloud was created and I couldn't see anything and I was in no pain and I could hear all the guys around me shouting and screaming trying to figure out what had gone on and my gut instinct was that we had been attacked. I thought someone had fired a rocket or a mortar in our position, it had exploded nearby which is why this dust cloud was created and instantly I was thinking find out where the attack came from, neutralise the threat and get everybody out safely so we can get back to somewhere a bit better tactically where we could fight from and then that reduces the chance of anybody being hurt or killed. So I'm just listening while you know, everyone's shouting and screaming and I can't see anything and I just wait for this dust cloud to settle and I think if I can see what's going on, I can assess the situation better, make some calls and figure something out. And the cloud gets to about chest height and you got to imagine I'm pumped full of adrenaline, my fight and flight is kicked in, I'm, I'm ready to go. And I'm looking around and I'm panicking, just hoping that everyone's okay and I can't see anybody. So I carry on waiting for this dust cloud to settle and it hits the ground it disappears and I look down to where my legs should have been and they had both been completely ripped off uh, from the knees down. Yeah, it was, um, anyone who's been in any sort of traumatic incident will understand this, but it's very surreal. Your br I think your brain finds it very hard to process what it is it's looking at. And then when you add to that, the fact that you're not in any pain, just, just very uncomfortable. It's like an intense pins and needles feeling. You're trying to look at this and process it and it doesn't feel real. And there's no pain, which makes it feel even less real. And it's just, everything inside is going at a thousand mile an hour, but everything outside is in slow motion while you're trying to figure this out. And, you know, the way your body reacts is, is crazy, the way it just goes into like self-preservation mode. But despite, you know, the severity of my injuries, both legs, my right arm was, was torn off, it was still attached, but everything was just shredded inside. Despite the severity of my injuries, this crater that I was in, I've read the report, it was now 12 feet deep by 15 feet around. There were six other devices around me. Despite all of that, like I said earlier, those men that I was working with were so professional and good at what they did. I never really thought that I wouldn't make it out of there. And they just clicked straight into action. That No one panicked, nobody froze, nobody went outside of protocol, we'd rehearsed this kind of stuff. They all just kicked straight in, did what they needed to do. And the medic got to me very, very quickly. You know, he, he did what he needed to do. He put the morphine in, put the tourniquets on, put me on a stretcher. My, my right leg was still attached and we had to pick it up and put it on my stomach because it was hanging off the end of a stretcher. I don't know how they got me off this high feature because I had my eyes closed, but they got me out of this crater, off this high feature to where our vehicle was waiting. And they put me in the back of the vehicle and it, th these are not tarmac roads, these are very, very bumpy. So the guy driving floors the accelerator and I'm getting thrown all over the back of this vehicle. He starts climbing up this hill to go into the front entrance of the camp and he's got to go left and right because of the terrain. And the medic fell out the back. I fell out the back. The guy driving swung around, reached out to grab me to hold me in. He grabbed the femur bone that was coming out my right leg, kind of held me, my tailbone is on the, the back end of the vehicle, the tailgate. He held me half in, half out. The medic was fine, because that other section we were with earlier with those eight heavily armed men, they were at the bottom of the hill, so the medic was safe. He carried on driving, got me back into the camp, got me to the helicopter landing site. And the last thing I remember is this Chinook coming into land, this huge sandstorm that it creates from the propeller blades the exhaust, the heat from the exhaust beating down on me in the back of this vehicle. And then like the mechanical noise of the tailgate dropping. And then I, I blacked out at that point, which is when I later found out that they had classed me as dead. You know, that was it. When I got on the back of the helicopter, they, they checked me for signs of life. They said I didn't have any of, of what they were looking for. And they 
put me in a corner because there was there was one other casualty and they had to get to work on him to make sure that he didn't die as well. So yeah, um, intense, pretty intense. Yeah, I mean, so let's just t- that take a break from it for a second because I mean, that, it, if that's not, like it is mm-hmm. absolutely mind blowing. Um, so just for a description, what is an IED to, to the average person who, who wouldn't know, how would you describe an IED? So IED stands for Improvised Explosive Device, and that's exactly what it means. It's improvised, so it can it can be anything. And in this particular situation, it was an anti-personnel mine, which is only designed to, to blow off a foot. The idea behind them is it will maim somebody, and then when everyone else goes in to help them, you know the enemy will usually pop over the hill with AK-47s and wipe everyone out. So it was an anti-personnel mine. But on top of it, they had put the warhead of a 107 millimeter Chinese rocket, which is like a show launch rocket, which will take the side of the house off. So I stood on the warhead. The warhead put pressure on the mine. The plates in the mine touched. The mine erupted. The warhead erupted. And then I erupted. And the only thing I can think of as to why I'm still alive is the angle that it got me at. If it went straight up, literally would have incinerated me there would have been nothing left in my body but i can only think that because we're in a bowl it it came at an angle and it took me out at like a 45 degree angle which is why everything here is untouched and, and still intact it was just i put my right arm down to get onto my belly and it just took off both the legs and the arm so um you're in the you black out in the the helicopter you wait for <coughs> Um, in a military hospital, did you get taken to, was it like a temporary hospital or was it like something like that? So I'll tell you what was insane about the whole thing in the back of a helicopter is, you know, they checked me for a pulse, they checked me to try and put fluids in me, they couldn't, they put an oxygen mask on me which should have steamed up but it didn't, so that's why they said, okay, this guy's dead, leave him. Now when one of the medics walked past me to get some equipment to work on the other guy, he said that my eyes started to flutter which meant my heart was still beating. So he alerted some of the other medics. They came back. And three days before this incident, whoever is in charge of the, the army medical field had given the green light for this new technique to be used, where if you can't get intravenous lines into somebody's veins, you drill into their tibia and fibula and you put the line in there. So that's what they wanted to do to me. Problem being, my tibias and fibulas had been ripped off by this IED. So they had nothing to work with now through their quick thinking and and their courage they thought okay we'll try his hip bone so they drilled into my hip from the front and back they put a line in they said the first time that the skin was too loose so it didn't bite so they pulled it they tightened it and they put it in again and they said the second time it bit the fluids went in and within like three minutes they said I was back and I was awake and I was responsive and I was answering their questions coherently. I wasn't babbling, I was actually giving them legible answers. So they flew me back to Camp Bastion um, to the temporary field hospital that was there. And the surgeons that were working that day had a look at the damage caused by the IED and and it was a a mess. And they decided that the only way they were going to be able to save my life is if they took off both my legs above the knee and my right arm above the elbow. So at, at that point, what was the, was you conscious? Was you, so at, at what point did you wake up and, and start to have a realisation of the situation? So I, like I said, I passed out when the Chinook landed and I woke up uh, four days later, on the 28th of December in Selly Oak Hospital in Birmingham in intensive care. I woke up for about 15 seconds um, and then just passed back out because I was exhausted. And then the, ne- the next point was after was that would you have been after surgery and so what they did in intensive care they they kind of reduced the medication to bring you out of the coma and i woke up for that first 15 seconds and was i couldn't even open my eyes i was so exhausted and then i blacked out but they kind of knew then that i was not that i was okay but that i was making progress so then they started reducing the medication they brought me out of the coma and then i spent seven days in intensive care each day spending more and more time awake in the real world, reducing the medication so that I could 
gradually understand where I was, what had happened and, and the severity of my injuries. And, you know, they did it perfectly. You know, it wasn't like I woke up cold turkey and was like, where am I, what's happened and started freaking out. It was like a gradual drip feed day by day over the, the course of a week where initially I thought I'd lost my feet and some fingers. And by the end of seven days, I realized it was both legs above the knee and my right arm above the elbow. Once you'd had that realization and you'd, you'd been able to come to terms with the situation, what was your, what, what was your initial mind like? like where, where was you at in your head? Um, initially, I wasn't in a good place. You know, I was 24 years old. I was at that time six foot two, 16 stone, physically, I think at, at my peak. And then I woke up in hospital and I'm like four foot three. Because of losing three limbs and the, the infections I was fighting off, I was probably eight stone 11, I think. And full of tubes and everything. And I also had a, a huge hole in my hand from a shrapnel wound. I could only use two fingers and was just lying in bed thinking that's all I could do and initially I was not in a good place but I had incredible support around me you know from my family from the Royal Marines all the doctors nurses surgeons everyone around me just kind of came together to to get me through those initial couple of weeks of of dark thoughts and hardship and it worked out, you know, it worked out in the end. How, how do you go from being in such a negative place and, and dealing with a trauma at the exact same time as well and turning it into a positive and starting to turn that around and, and start to work on your own mindset, your own mentality? I think in the beginning, there was a lot of kind of falseness between me and the people around me. It was almost like false positivity. You know, if I was feeling bad, I would act like I wasn't. And if, if they were struggling, they would act like they weren't. And it, even though it was a little bit false, it helped. And, it, you know, just trying to force a bit more of a positive atmosphere kind of really helped. And then three and a half weeks into it, uh, a doctor walked in. He wasn't part of my team. I'd not met him before. And he told me he was the, the UK's leading professional in the field of amputations. Like for 33 years at that point, he had been amputating people's limbs, following up their progress, and he was like the UK's guru. And he came in and said, I have never met anybody in my 33 plus years who's got one leg missing above the knee that has any success using prosthetics. So you need to start mentally preparing yourself for life in a wheelchair. And you've got to imagine, I've come from like alpha male peak to now at 24 years old. In my mind, thinking I need carers, people to wash me, people to feed me, you know, push me around in a wheelchair. And, you know, that's really not what I wanted to hear at that stage. I'm three and a half weeks into my recovery. So that sent me into a spiral. And, you know, I don't mind admitting this. I, I contemplated suicide at that point. But about a week later, I got an unexpected visit in my, my hospital room and a guy knocked on the door and he came in and he was wearing two prosthetic legs. And he was a double above knee amputee like I was. He had both his arms, but he, our legs were very similar. And he sat me down and he talked me through his journey. He had been hit by a suicide bomber in Iraq in 2005. He talked me through the journey of getting from the hospital to, to getting prosthetics, to regaining your independence and what it was gonna take and you know some of his highs and lows. And after about six hours, he left and that was it. My, my mindset was changed because I had physically seen somebody who had achieved what I wanted to achieve. And then it didn't matter what you told me about how you couldn't do this and couldn't do that. I, I witnessed it with my own eyes, someone else doing it, which meant to me there was no reason at all why I couldn't do it. And I knew I was missing the right arm, that was my dominant arm, but it didn't matter. You know, I, I saw this guy had done that, I listened to what he told me, and from that point on, I was like, there's no way, you can stop me, give me the legs, give me the rehab, let's go. So what was the goal in your mind then, at that point? Um, after seeing him, what was your goal? I, I set goals very early on, and this is what I attribute a lot of success to, is having goals and something to focus on and drive towards. And my goal was when my unit came back, because they were still in Afghanistan while I was in hospital, 
my goal was when they came back and we had our big medals parade at the unit with all our friends and family in attendance, that I would wear prosthetic legs. You know, it wasn't going to be pretty, but I was going to walk onto the parade ground and stand and get that medal. I didn't want to be in a wheelchair with people pitying me and feeling sorry for me. And so I instantly, after, after meeting that guy, Mick, in hospital, set that as my goal. And then I got out of hospital after six weeks, got straight to rehab. I couldn't jump straight into prosthetics because of the scars and, and the wounds that I had, but I worked on everything else. I started working my core and all the other muscles I needed to work to be able to walk my glutes, hips, lower back, strengthening those day by day, getting stronger, making sure I was eating the right kind of foods. You know, rest wasn't a problem because I couldn't do much else but rest and do a little bit of physical activity. But having that go was massive because you know, you get up in the morning and your back hurts and you've got blisters in your groin and you just, you know, you're exhausted and you don't want to do anything. But having that go and the thought of failing that just drives you, you know, and I didn't want to, in my mind, I didn't want to let anybody down. I wanted to go up there, stand shoulder to shoulder with those guys that I fought with, make them proud, make the wider Royal Marines proud, make friends and family proud. And so that was it. Like when I felt sorry for myself, I just always went back to that goal and I thought, this is what I'm doing it for. Let's keep pressing on. What were the obstacles, you know, to, to reach the goal? Oh, God, every day was an obstacle. Uh, it take, for a double above knee amputee, it takes anywhere between 300 and 500% more energy for me to do anything than it does for an able-bodied person. And so I thought, you know, being a Royal Marine, I'm pretty fit, it's not gonna be an issue. It was an issue. You know, I, I, the first day I walked one length of the parallel bars, which is about six meters, it wiped me out. I was exhausted. And I had to go back to my room and sleep and have an afternoon nap because it just wiped me completely out. And, you know, every day you're getting a little bit stronger, a little bit fitter, you're getting a little bit more used to the legs, but it's just unbelievably difficult in the beginning. You know, and then when you add to that, that I only had one arm and it was my weak arm and I'm trying to do everything and relearn and, you know, every, every, everything was an obstacle in, in those early days. Um, absolutely everything. And what, was, what did you go back to to keep you motivated? Was it the idea of that goal of walking onto the parade? Absolutely. I, I, I had such a, a vivid picture in my mind of what that would look like with, you know, desert uniform on, green beret on, everyone formed up on the parade ground, thousands of people's friends and family around, and me just standing at the sidelines. And like I said, it wouldn't be pretty, but I would do what I could to get onto that parade ground and stand next to them for when that medal got presented to me. And that was, it was such a, a vivid image that it just motivated the heck out of me just to go off and do whatever it took, no matter how sore I was, tired I was, how many times I hit the deck and you know cut myself, bruised myself. I would just go back at the end of the day remember why I was doing it, remember what the goal was, and then just shake it off and start again the next day. And did, did you get that moment? Which one's that? The walk it, walking out for the parade yourself. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, we did. How did that feel like? What was the day like? Even that, and I hope I didn't show it too much, but even that was horrendous. I was in unbelievable amounts of pain because I still haven't healed properly. I had a like a walking stick, but like I said, it's 300 to 500% more energy. Even for me to stand on the spot, it's like you march, you know, like jogging on the spot with your knees up high. And I was there for 45 minutes and I was just terrified. I was terrified that I was gonna fall over and embarrass myself and hurt myself. But I just, you know, I had a constant conversation in my head about why I was there, why I was doing it and, and what it was gonna be like if I was successful. So turning the vision, like you said, you've planted that vision in your head like a manifestation mm -hmm. and, and achieving it and, and getting it. Um, I, I know people can apply it their own life all the time, mm -hmm. and people do, but was that one of the first, the first things, I mean obviously getting into the military, you probably did use a similar sort of technique, but when that came around and it happened, did it just solidify that you can continually use this for the future? Absolutely. And, and it also, you know, I started reflecting after that day and I realized that I'd done it before. So when I competed in martial arts, I always used to visualize myself getting my hand raised. When I was going through Royal Marines training, I always visualized what it would feel like to be presented with that green beret. And then when I 
you know, achieved that goal at the Meadows Parade. I came home here on a Friday evening and I just thought, this is what I need to do in my life for everything. Not just, you know, set one goal to walk at the Meadows Parade, fitness, finance, family, every, every area that's important in my life. I need to set goals in these areas and drive forward towards achieving them because I think it's very dangerous not just in my situation, but in anyone's situation, if you stay static for too long and the, the negative thoughts start coming in. You've always got to have something positive to, to move towards and strive towards, to occupy your headspace. You know, 80, 90, 95% of it has got to be positive and driving forward towards something that you want to achieve. A lot, a lot of this is self-motivation, right? It's goals you're setting and it's a lot, it seems like a lot of internal. Was there anyone externally motivating you? Was there anyone inspiring you at the time? I had a lot of people, and the beauty is, like, just go on the internet. You know, you can find inspiration everywhere. And I was always researching people. There was a guy in America. I actually flew out to America in 2009 to be mentored by another triple amputee because I was the UK's first. And I knew if I needed to level up, I needed to learn from this guy. And he was running, swimming, surfing, driving. He was a motivational speaker. And I was being told, you know, you can't do this, you can't do that, that's not possible, no one's ever done that before. And I'm watching this guy, Cameron, on the internet doing all these things that people tell me a triple amputee shouldn't be able to do. And his injuries were exactly the same as mine. In fact, his arm was even higher than mine. And I'm just watching this guy doing it all. And I constantly consumed his content as, as motivation, you know, because I, again, I saw it was physically possible and I knew that if he could do it, I could do it. And I eventually ended up in, on the 9th of June, 2009, I flew out to meet him. I went through a three week boot camp with him and his team. They made me leave my wheelchair in the UK. They made me fly on my own. Couldn't take anyone with me, which I don't mind admitting was terrifying at the time, but they, they hammered me for three weeks solid. And I never used my wheelchair since. 9th of June, 2009, you can search my house. That there's not a wheelchair here or anywhere near here. I got rid of it, gave it to the hospital and just became a full-time prosthetic user. Um, for me, seeing somebody else do something is like a big, it's a big thing. Like, like you say, like you see someone else do it, you can do it mm -hmm. at that point. How important is it for us to be, to lead, lead our lives in that way? You know, like somebody who's going through something who's struggling now to, to find themselves on the other side of it and talk about like reaching back over and helping somebody else mm -hmm. and, and being that example for somebody else. Yeah. And do you know what? The, the reason there's, there's a couple of reasons why I live my life the way I do. The first one is to let the guys on the ground that saved me know, the medics on the helicopter that saved me know, the doctors, nurse, everyone that's been involved in my journey, to let them know that everything they did was perfect and correct. And you know, I'm out living my life the fullest I can because of what they did for me, but also because I want to show other people. You know, it's it's a pretty severe situation to be in when when you lose three limbs, and if I can live my life the way I want to live it and enjoy it and, and embrace everything that this brings with it, I'm hoping that can inspire other people to do the same thing. No, definitely. It definitely, I mean, it definitely does, 100%. Mm -hmm. um, how, how did you, on the flip side of it, how did you deal with people telling you that you couldn't do something? Like specifically saying, like, you can't, well, negative, negative sort of comments about it. Mm. You're not going to walk again or, you know, you shouldn't be trying this. How did you deal with that at the time? Well, how do you deal with it now as well? Now is very different. Back then, because I didn't know a lot about this new situation, it, it just used to frustrate me. And I would say, okay, let's try. And people weren't very receptive to that. And, and I understand it because people were worried I'd hurt myself or, or do something silly, you know, and they were trying to protect me. But when I was seeing someone else in a similar situation doing it all the time and saying, this guy's doing it, let's do it. People just didn't want to embrace it, which is why I ended up going over to meet him anyway. And my mindset changed and I was introduced to a whole new world of, you know, being an amputee, using prosthetics, the tools that you can use as an amputee to achieve what you want to achieve. So if I want to go hiking, I wouldn't wear these legs, I'd wear my little ones. If I want to go swimming, I can wear prosthetics, I can do it without them. You know, my mind was open to what I can achieve. So now when people say, you know, you can't do this, you can't do that, I won't go at it with a with that attitude of, you know, just watch me, you know, Mr. Angry. I just be like, okay, we'll we'll try. And we'll give it our best shot. We'll see what resources we've got, you know, and we'll do as much as we can. And 
99% of the time, if, if it's something that I'm passionate about and really want to achieve, we'll figure it out. Love it. So how, how could somebody apply that to themselves? I think you just have to have confidence in yourself. And you need to be, I think, smart with it. Like I said, it's not about attacking it head on full of anger and you know trying to prove everyone wrong. You just got to be tactical with whatever it is that you want to achieve. And there's inspiration everywhere. I don't know, you know, if you wanted to be, I don't know, like a property millionaire, right? Just go and find someone who's already been a property millionaire. Find out what they did physically, mentally, you know, and kind of replicate it as closely as you can. That's what I did with Cameron in America. I found a guy who achieved what I wanted to achieve and I went out and met him and I mirrored what he did as closely as I possibly could to achieve the results that he had as closely as I possibly could. You know, it's not that complicated, you know, but you've got to want it enough. It's got to be, you've got to be passionate about it and it's got to be something that gives you goosebumps when you think about it. It's not like, okay, I want to be a property millionaire. Why? It'd be nice, wouldn't it? No, because it's going to give me financial freedom and I can do so much with that money and help so many people or whatever your motivation is. It's got to give you goosebumps and get you excited. You know what I mean? 100%, yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. Um, what, what, is there a moment, a particular moment in the whole span of your career in life that's given you the most perspective, like a lesson that you've learned at all? There, there's been a couple. The first was when I achieved my Green Beret. You know, I was only 18 years old at the time, so I was, I was still a boy. And when I got that, and it was presented to me, it massively opened my eyes to what you can achieve if, you've, if you're mentally prepared in the right way and you have the right mindset. Because I was not, and I am not, the, the fittest or strongest person in the world. I'm just ridiculously stubborn, and I'll just keep driving forward, driving forward, and driving forward no matter what. And then I... When I went through rehab, it was exactly the same. It was, you know, this is the goal. Just keep moving forward, keep moving forward. And even if you're just making 1% every day, you're still moving forward. Just keep that mindset of move forward, move forward, move forward. And then eventually, you're going to achieve what you set out to achieve. To me, you're talking like that both those things are extremely difficult things to do. Like, and one of them was by choice, you know, you went through the green back, but another one wasn't by choice. Um, you know, if something isn't happening in someone's life where it's like a, a test or um, an obstacle to overcome, should they go out and seek something to test their will and mindset and ex like advance themselves as a person? Should they try and find something difficult to do? In my opinion, I think we all should spend a bit of time living outside our comfort zone, doing something that pushes you and challenges you and forces you to grow physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, whatever it is. Because my belief is that human beings are the happiest when they're making progress and they're moving forward with something, you know, and, and that's gonna look different for different people. But, I mean, you just think about it, and people go on weight loss journeys or fitness journeys, you know, and, and they're seeing progress. That's when they're full of life and energy. When they've pushed outside their comfort zone, they've set a goal and they're taking steps towards achieving that goal. You know, you can do that in so many different areas of your life. It could be with your children, with your finances, with your career, you know, but it's not always easy to do because it feels uncomfortable, you know, but that's where the growth is and that's where the magic happens. You've got to push outside the comfort zone. The proudest moment in, in, your, in your life? My goodness, I've got a lot. Um, this, and this is going to sound corny, but like, like right here, right now, with the way, you know, the way my children have grown up, the way my family are, the way my career is, the way my health is, everything that has gone on before has, has led to this moment right now. And everything feels great, you know, despite my situation and circumstances, and people find this difficult, they think it's all, you know, sometimes when I say this stuff, it's false. But everything's led to this point now where my life is great, you know, and that's probably what I'm proudest of, the, the effort and the work that I've put into to create this life. It's funny you say that the next one was uh, a quote actually that I took off your Instagram, create your own future. Mm -hmm. How important is it to be in control of our own destiny? 
it's the ultimate. And this is going to sound really corny, but I've died once and I realise how quick that can happen and how fast things can change. And what I do not want to do is get to, you know, 105 years old, because my big goal is to live past 100 and think that I didn't squeeze all the juice out of my life. You know, and there's no real reason why anyone can't do any of the things that they want to do. You know, we live in, you know, it's 2021. You can run a business on a smartphone. I've got 100,000 pounds of a prosthetic legs that I can do anything with. I can travel the world independently as a guy missing three limbs. I can do whatever I want. You know, you can so much with the technology that we have nowadays that the whole world's open to, to just go out and do whatever you love, whatever you're passionate about, and live the way you want to live. You just got to ditch the excuses and kind of move out of your comfort zone a little bit and just go with it. I mean, you're talking about it a little bit there, but what, what motivates you today? Like, what keeps you driving it now? My ultimate vision, my ultimate goal is to become the ultimate version of myself. And what's beautiful about that is you can't ever achieve it and it keeps you constantly striving forward. So I'm getting, I'm going through a phase right now where I'm 38, right? And I'm starting to tailor off a little bit physically. I can't move as fast or as strongly as I used to, but I'm adapting and rolling with it because I still want to keep pushing and going and becoming, you know, better as I age. And um, I just want to, Deep inside, know that I've, I've always pushed myself to be the best version that I can be as, as, as husband, father, employee, member of society, athlete, whatever it is. I'm just always trying to keep pushing the envelope a little bit. When, when you're in those, those low moments, those dark moments, what would be your advice to, to somebody who is feeling the same, like who, who might be going through it? On the other side of it, what would you tell those people? For someone who's having a bad time, really tough trauma like we're talking like sim like traumas that like you've been through yourself mm -hmm. like what's your advice to those people so this isn't easy but it's powerful and when you're in it's in the, in those moments you need to search for what you're grateful for so i lost both my legs and my right arm but i was grateful that i still had a fully functioning left arm and my face is untouched i have no internal injuries i have no traumatic brain injuries I don't have post-traumatic stress disorder. You know, those are all things for me to be grateful of. I have this technology, you know, back then my mindset was, I have this technology that's gonna enable me to live an independent life. They're all things to be grateful for, the support system around me, you know, all that kind of stuff. You have to, you have to work at it, but you can find something to be grateful for in, in any situation, you know. As bad as it gets, if nothing else, just know it's going to make you stronger when you come out the other side of it and that's something to be grateful for. Uh, this is another one from your Instagram and you, you talk about this a lot, uh, no limits. Mm -hmm. uh, what does that mean to you? Exactly what it says, no limits. Don't, don't limit what you can achieve. You know, 30, 40 years ago, someone in my situation probably would have been very limited. You know, I've been in a wheelchair, probably with carers, people looking after me and my life would have been very different to the way it is now. But you want to talk about gratitude again, look at the day and age we live in. I, I run two businesses from a mobile phone. You know, I get to go out and share my story with the world and, and earn a living from it. You know, I'm, I'm grateful for all of that stuff. Nothing's limited. There's opportunity in adversity. Nowadays, more than ever, you can take a bad situation like this and flip it on its head and turn it into something brilliant. Not only to create the life you want to live, but to help motivate and inspire other people. But those early goals that you set, do you feel like you've achieved them? Absolutely, yeah. I'm almost getting to a point now when I'm running out of things to do. Um, so as I get older, my, my mindset changes a little bit and my focus changes a little bit. Where's your focus right now? I think it's more on, and I've been doing it for a while, but kind of subconsciously, more on influencing my children. And, it, more, and when we came out from the gym just now, some of the stuff my son was saying in the car, was like, almost got me welling up, you know, the stuff that was coming out of his mouth for a nine-year-old. And I thought, that's quite profound, you know, and he was saying about how I had helped him to think that way. And that's a big thing, you know, you can influence as many millions of people as you want on Instagram or TikTok or YouTube, but you know, it's, it's 
it's your family, your children, your, your close circle that I think means the most. Yeah, 100%. Um, I mean, these are just some words. It's not like a, a quick fire thing. It really helps with the editing process. Um, but when I say them, I just want you to say like what you feel about that certain thing. Mm -hmm. and just say as much as you want or as little as you want on it. Um, so the first word is strength. Power. I mean, the second one is power. So uh, how, 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 <laughs> how does it make you feel like, um, I mean, at the moment, like in the gym, you're creating a, a physical power every single day. Like, what does it mean to have that power? That's a deep question. Um, I don't know, p power is it's being all you can be. You know what I mean? It's um, unleashing your full potential. That's what that means to me. Um, what, does it, what does it mean to have a passion? A lot of people out, I, I know a lot of people out there who are still struggling to find a passion. I feel like just through the way you talk, you've got a passion. Mm -hmm. And what, what does that mean to you? And also, if you have any sort of advice on how to find your passion. I mean, everyone has a passion. You know what I mean? Like you say, it's just maybe finding it. And people maybe know what it is, but don't recognize it as a passion. Some people can be passionate about watching movies. That's the thing that they love to do more than anything else in the world. Do more of that. Some people love, I don't understand why they do this, but like ultra marathon runners, it's crazy, it's sick, but they love that, it's passionate. Go do more of that. You know, it's, um, you have to do the things that you love in, in life. You know, when I was in the Marines, I loved that. I loved the people around me. I loved the, the way it made me grow, the experiences I got to have. Now, as a triple amputee, I'm passionate about living my life the best that I can and, and going out and doing all the things that I want to do. You know what I mean? So you, you, you have to do it. You have to do it. And don't make excuses why you can't do it. And work too hard. Get up an hour earlier. I've got kids. So have I. You know, you work it around. Double tap it. Bring your kids in. Involve them in the passion. You know, I love doing jujitsu. I take my boy to jujitsu with me. I'm spending time with him and I'm doing what I love. Hopefully then he'll develop some sort of passion out of that. And he'll discover what he loves. And you just spread it around. But you just, you can't get trapped into that cycle of you know just going around the hamster wheel you know you've got to take that time to, to figure out what you love doing 100 percent. For, for me it's uh it's sad to see when when people don't find it um you train very hard so i don't know if you if you venture into this at all but obsession is that something that you you've dealt with like with the physical training and like getting obsessed with it or do you feel like you've always kept a healthy relationship with it if i'm competing a for something, then I do become obsessed, but I would call it a healthy obsession. So 2017, 2018, I competed in the Invictus Games, representing the UK with um, different countries from all over the world. And that was a bit of an obsession for two years. I'd be here in this garage at five o'clock, four or five days a week doing cardio. I would have a full day, uh, full-time day job, and then I would do strength and conditioning in the evening and spend my weekends doing sports-specific training. And that was two years of, of obsession. It never got unhealthy. I, I'd always keep it healthy and, and keep that in mind, keep that balance. But yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. People can tip too far and, and be obsessed and that comes at a cost. You've got to keep that obsession healthy. I think it, as long as you're happy still. like And you, the people around you and are happy the, And you're not affecting the people around you, right. for sure. I feel like you're in the right place. Mm -hmm. um, pain, uh, obviously, physical pain for yourself, but also mental pain um, for yourself as well. Is like, how, how have you dealt with that? And yeah, what does it mean to you? Like the, the word pain when you hear it? Pain, the, the first thing that jumps into my mind when you say pain is that it's just an obstacle. Physical pain, mental pain, it's all stuff that you can overcome. You know, I used to, in the beginning, have something called phantom limb pain which is when you would feel like your limbs were still there and you'd get cramps and like a lightning bolt hitting you under a toenail, stuff you couldn't get rid of. And I figured out a way around it without the use of medication. I cold turkey, ditched my medication and started putting weight through my, the ends of my legs and eventually it got rid of that physical pain. You know what I mean? It's all stuff that can be overcome one way or another. The mental pain is very similar. You know, a lot of people spend a massive amount of time training their body, but not very much time 
train their mind. You know, read the right books, consume the right content on social media, meditate, you know, spend time out. Stop watching garbage on telly. Spend that hour reading something that's going to strengthen your mind, you know, and, and help you to grow. As an athlete, um, the word winning and losing, those words come up quite a lot. Uh, how do you deal with both of them? And I think, I actually think people sit on losing wrong, like their opinions mm -hmm. on losing is very wrong. So I'm interested in your opinion personally. Losing and failure. And failure, this, exactly. is, this is something that I've, um, as I've got older, I've understood a bit better. But failure, it's not failure if you learn from it, right? So again, I'll give you an example from the Invictus Games. I went there the first year and all I wanted to do was win gold medals. And I came back with two silvers and two bronzes. And I thought I'd failed. So I applied again for the next year. And then I took the lessons from those failures and applied them in my training for the following year, came back with four gold medals. So it's just, it's temporary. You have to learn, if you just go, okay, I failed, I'm done. Then you failed. But if you go, okay, I didn't quite achieve the objective that time. What did I do wrong? What can I change and adjust? How can I tweak it? Then I'm going to go at it again with those adjustments. And then nine times out of 10, that's where the success happens. So, I mean, that leads on to quitting for me, like, because there is one where you're learning from it, but also quitting. What, what does uh, quitting mean? Like, and, and what can it mean to somebody's progress or success? I think, first of all, you have to make a decision as to if the thing you're pursuing is something that you really want. You know what I mean? Is it healthy to quit it? Because it's a waste of time and you're not going to achieve it. Like, I'm never going to be. I'm never going to play football for England. Do you know what I mean? I've got no legs, so why pursue that goal? That's just daft, and I would quit that very quickly to pursue something more wholesome. But if it's something you really want to achieve and you're really passionate about, I think it's the old cliche of, you know, take a step back, take some time off, chill out and relax a little bit, but don't quit and then come back at it again. You know, just, it's okay to take your foot off the gas for a bit. If this is something you really, really want, just don't quit. Take that time, relax, refocus, reassess, realign, and then go back at it. Um, so the, the last one I want to ask you about is just the biggest lesson you've learned, like over, over the span. Like, what do you feel like the biggest lesson you've learned? I think a lot of people can relate to this. Like when you are training or competing or you're trying to achieve something and physically you're in a lot of pain and your brain starts telling you you're in pain and you know just stop just quit and you know you maybe you're running you throw up and whatever it is when that voice starts creeping in you're probably only about 40 percent physically to actually shutting down and once you understand that and you know it's part of the process and part of the game and you can you, you know you say okay i'm at that point now i want to quit just push a little bit more and then I'm through it. That was, that's the biggest thing I've ever learned. Like whenever that voice creeps in, you're not even halfway to your body failing. I love that, I, I really love that. What, at, at the moment, what are you working on? What, like, where can people find you as well? And uh, yeah, just a, everything that you do at the moment, love to hear it. So I'm just about to do a 100 mile bike ride on my hand bike for Reorg, the charity. I am finishing my second book. I am making a movie about my life story and I am constantly and consistently trying to grow my social media. So I'm, I'm on everything, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, even TikTok, YouTube, podcast, uh, it's on all the normal platforms. Just trying to take some of these things that we've talked about and, and spread them you know, across the digital world to try and reach as many people as possible. Yeah, I th I, and honestly, like, I mean, just a small snippet of what we spoke about today, but I'm guessing across all those platforms, especially like podcasting, you go in a lot more depth as well. Absolutely. Yeah, so I mean, what we'll do is link everything down below and I hope people who have been inspired by this or have got something from it will go and use those resources. Mm -hmm. um, which, what's the best, would you say, that you feel like you're most interactive on? Instagram. Instagram, mm -hmm. okay, so yeah. On Instagram, we'll link you down below as well for that. But um, honestly, just hearing your story, like it's so inspirational, so motivational. Um, 
I know a lot of people will watch it and take a lot from it, so I just appreciate the fact that you do it. I'm very grateful for your time as well. No worries, man. Yeah, no thank worries. you, man. Is there anything you wanted to ask? Yeah, you? the last question is as if you was answering to Jordan. You know, you talk about this dark moon of like constant contemplating committing suicide and all that sort of stuff. Do you think if you didn't have the, the support network, do you think you would be in this position that you are in now? And like, how do you think your life would be different if you didn't have the support around you? Okay. So during those really low, really dark moments, the support system around you is crucial. And when you move forward from that and, and they help pull you out of that, you realise that in life in general, it's very advantageous to have good people around you. You know, keep, you that, keep that circle tight of good people that support you, empower you, motivate you, inspire you, kind of get rid of anything else, you know, anything that causes you to feel negative mentally, get rid of it or limit the time that you spend with it slash them and just keep that solid support network around you, you know, and that will help you in bad times and in good times. Just, you know, the, the feeling of suicide, just something I wanted to, I, I did want to cover. I don't know if we'll use it at all. In hindsight, could you see that as a fleeting feeling? As something that, in hindsight, you can understand. You can understand why you had the feeling, but also it wasn't a a genuine thought that you wanted to go through with. Like, is it, is it something you can look back in hindsight with? Yeah, it absolutely. It's um, I was dealing with a lot, and it got to the point where you kind of feel like you've you've snapped. And then the only really thing you think is, I don't want to do this. You know, and, and it is, and I mean this with, with utmost respect, it's a little bit of a pity party where you're just feeling sorry for yourself because you don't know what the answer is. And I, I never would have done it. I, I was never in that place mentally where, you know, I was numb or never saw a future. You know, I was just feeling sorry for myself. And to be honest, a bit, a bit of humour brought me out of it because I remember thinking I can't even cut my own wrists because I can't do it. I've got nothing, no... And it kind of, I laughed to myself lying in that bed and was like, okay, let's go. Let's move forward. We've had our pity party. Let's go. I love it. Leave, is there anything you think we're not calling? No, it's perfect. Thank you, mate. Thank you. Oh, honestly, honestly, yeah, honestly. This is... So these two will start editing it together and, uh, mm -hmm. like, just going through it, like, I can feel the sound bites already here. And I'll give you a